Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. I am super excited to introduce our guest for this week, my good friend and mentor, Matt Wood. Matt, if you can give an introduction about yourself and your experience in this industry for our listeners, that'd be great. Sure. Thanks, Andy. Uh, I've worked in IT now uh, since since 2008 in various roles in development, um, you know, for web applications, Oracle PeopleSoft, um, sales and inventory data, warehousing, network infrastructure globally. Uh, most recently, now doing uh, security operations engineering, uh, and then was promoted into a manager role. Um, the current company I'm at of the security team. Uh, we cover both cyber and physical security. So it's uh, it's been kind of this it's a nice growth uh, pattern. But I mean, I came came from IT. Awesome. So our episode this week is really to talk about mentorship in information security. And I wanted to bring you on because you were my first mentor, whether you know it or not, I consider you my first mentor in the information security space. And I think personally, it's important to kind of pass along this knowledge, but I wanted to see what your take is on mentorship in general, whether it's you're officially a mentor to somebody or unofficially people come to you and ask for advice in information security. Maybe they're thinking about getting into the field. How important do you think mentorship is within the information security industry? It probably goes for all professions, but uh, mentorship is is really important. Um, It plays a role in like guiding and advising folks, um, you know, who are looking to develop their careers. Um, It allows folks who've been in the profession for a while to share what they've learned um, with others in in order to, you know, more deeply understand their experience and their perspective, as well as pass on some of that hard-earned knowledge um, to really kind of grow and foster that new, um, that new group of people coming up. You know, finding new talent with an organization, it's really, uh, is, is one of the motives behind this whole end. Um, but, um, yeah, no, it's important. Do you, do you think it goes both ways even? Because in information security, I sometimes think about how the industry changes so fast. And some people say they have like 20 years of experience, but really, is it relevant experience? You know, so maybe... Do you think that some of the people coming up in the younger ranks might even teach you something? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, folks coming into the industry now have a lot of different perspectives and backgrounds. Some folks have traditional college degrees. Other folks have um, maybe a no degree or a two-year degree, and they've been working in uh, system administration roles or help desk roles um, and kind of growing up into it. Um, they bring a lot of perspective from those roles into into InfoSec. A lot of us can sometimes get uh, stuck in the corner, right? Um, we're not going out, we're not talking to people as much, we're not uh, rubbing elbows with our folks in the business, but folks coming from help desk roles or folks that have been running servers and they're integrating with the business analysts and business process folks, you know, they've got a lot of those connections and a new view on how to look at the business. So if you've been in security for five years um, and you may not have been as as, as deep as you could have been in a business process role, you know, and you might find a business process person or a help desk person who, who's got this depth of experience now, and they can bring that in information security. So when you're like looking at a system, doing a vulnerability assessment, looking at, you know, looking for misconfigurations, doing scans, um, reviewing identity access management, I mean, you know, run the gambit here, that person is going to have a different perspective because they're going to understand how the system's being used by the business, um, as well as, you know, how the system's implemented. And some some legacy systems that are out there now um, that folks still operate on-prem, um, you know, are, are a little tougher to secure, and you're going to need some of that perspective. So the, these folks can bring a lot of that into, into this, and you can learn a lot from them. I know you have a traditional networking background, and a lot of security professionals came from networking back in the day. That's kind of the original information security folks. But as on-prem networks are 
less of a thing these days because of the cloud and and zero trust and all those other buzzwords that you hear about. Do you think having those skills is even more important than having a networking background? Or do you think still having those network engineers and networking backgrounds, people can still transition to information security? Or are you looking for more people who have those help desk and infrastructure experience? recruiting perspective a lot of the really good information security people have this like i don't want to call it like an innate curiosity but it's more of this like this drive this passion you know they have to not only know how something broke but how to fix it how to break it again and then how to set up from scratch and they won't stop until they understand the system completely um you know that's just one example there's other areas of life where this may apply but the curiosity the drive the passion the the not stopping piece is is really important um for folks because in security you're going to come upon a problem and you're not going to know how far to take it um you're going to be able to do you know an investigation or you're going to be collecting forensics data or you're going to be looking into um you know this machine got owned um you know our antivirus missed it why you know, and having to dive into those pieces, like how do we do the reverse engineering? Um, well, what about this thing and this thing and keep going around and, and bringing this, um, um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> yeah. You were talking about the innate curiosity in information security professionals and how they're the kind of people that when they were kids, you know, had to take things apart and put them back together to see how they worked. And I, I think you were, you were on a path of talking about how critical that is to being successful in the field is having that, that desire to want to fix things and tear them down and build them back up and, and how that relates to um, kind of finding potential for success in, in the role. Yeah, spot, the yeah, spot on, you know, and as Andy said, a lot of folks had come from, you know, a network administration background, a <clears throat> system administration background, um, you know, those skills are still important. You still have to secure Windows systems, right? You still mm -hmm. have to secure Linux and Mac OS. Um, you still have to look at those systems in the cloud as well. But at the end of the day, like, if somebody's got this drive, you can get them set up and say, hey, um, you know, here's, here's a class, there's a Microsoft certification class, you can go take this, you can learn these things, um, and then apply them on the job you don't have to actually have as much of that experience as before. Now, the mentoring piece, I think, comes in here as well. There's some folks who have 15, 20 years of sysadmin experience. That's hard one. That's really important. And that brings just this like elite perspective to, to like a security operations or an incident response role. That's really hard to teach to somebody to take 20 years experience and try and put it into a cert exam or, or some other class or YouTube video even um, without getting the hands on and like being able to intuit your way through the system, um, I think you can be at a disadvantage, but that can be learned. Um, but that curiosity exists, so. Did you have a mentor in this space when you started, or at least someone that you considered as a mentor? I think I've had more informal mentors than former mentors uh, overall. Um, I thought something like this might come up on uh, our discussion today, and I was trying to put some thought into it. I couldn't really come up with any concrete examples. Everybody that I've had from past team leads to past managers, past directors, um, you know, peers who had a different skill set than me, I've had this interaction with them. I think that's really helped to develop me. They've been able to share their experiences with me, both um, you know, on the InfoSec side as well as on previous IT roles. They've also been able to give me perspective on, on the business. You know, how do you run a budget? You know, what's finance looking for? What's a procurement process? How do you go through an RFP? Um, learning these things is also important, has really contributed to my ability to go from operations engineering into a more of a management role. Um, you know, there's, there's been a lot of people over my life that have contributed to, to, to get me to where I am now. I think that's the thing that scares people sometimes is they feel like you almost are asking a girl out to a dance in middle school or something. And it's like, do you want to go to the dance with me? It's, do you want to be my mentor? And I think that conversation is what intimidates people. And I think it loses sight of the fact that you will have mentors all over your career. And very rarely is there a formalized distinction that this is a mentorship kind of thing, but you are learning you're gaining new knowledge. You are drawing on the experience of someone who has different experience than you. 
that is mentorship. That's what it is. And when we are so focused on whether it has that label or not, we're losing sight of the fact that we have mentors all over the place. And so I think your answer was spot on in that you have mentors everywhere and you might not call them that, but there's so much experience you can draw upon. And when you have those relationships, you know, you can start to put some formalization around it. Like, Hey, can we, can we just sit down once a week and, you know, have you do a brain dump of topic X with me? And certainly you already have the relationship. Now it's a lot easier than, you know, asking the girl to the dance in middle school kind of thing. You know, it's a little easier. So I, I think take advantage of those organic mentorships that have grown out of your, your just peer relationships or your business relationships. They already exist. And it's just a matter of taking advantage of them in a lot of cases. Yeah. I just like to highlight the human element of that. You know, mentoring is a relationship for learning, for listening. Um, you know, we're very social creatures being humans. Um, and it's very important to have that, that kind of connection. I think back to, you know, when we were working together in that word curiosity, you know, that you talk about, I think in general, that quality in, in information security, we, as information security practitioners get really excited when we talk about information security. I think that's one of the things that if you're in the industry, you really like to talk about it. And if you find someone who's interested in talking about it, you can talk about it forever. When I got to my new company, me and my coworker who are both in information security, we'd sit down and lunch and we'd talk about information security. And of course, like, you know, some people would come by and they'd sit with us and like, okay, you guys need to stop talking about information security. <laughs> so it was kind of funny. And, and that's how it was. I think with you and me is, you know, I was interested in the topic and I think you're excited to talk about it and share if, if I'm asking questions. So I think that's important for both a mentor and mentee relationship is from a mentee aspect that that curiosity is going to excite your mentor to really want to share <laughs> because if you're knowledgeable about it and someone else is interested in hearing you talk, of course, you're going to want to talk about it, right? Andy, I think part of your discussion there that's interesting as you use the words like mentor, mentee, and obviously those are common. And, and sometimes those relationships, they can kind of be one-sided, right? But there are definitely two-sided mentorships too, where we're kind of both, it's more symbiotic. And I think like when we worked together at Microsoft, we had a lot of that where Andy, you had so much practical real world experience and, and you've had many different careers um, being a police officer, being in the military, where I was really able to learn from you in a lot of ways. But at the same time, I was able to teach you a lot of kind of the internal baseball of like how Microsoft functioned. And it was not just a one-sided mentorship. It wasn't just Adam teaching Andy, you taught me too. And I think sometimes there's also this misperception that it's incredibly one-sided when in reality, they can be very two-sided relationships where certainly I learned a lot from you as well. Um, even though I was in actually in a more formal capacity asked to kind of help bring you up to speed because you were kind of my, or I was your onboarding buddy kind of thing. So, you know, mm -hmm. someone mentioned to me recently in a hiring process. And I know since you're a hiring manager as well, and you, you look for people, I'm curious what your take on this is, Matt, when you're trying to hire someone for a role that you need to fill the comment that I heard, recently was everybody needs to cut their teeth somewhere, but they don't necessarily need to cut it here. So kind of like being a gatekeeper and, and looking for people with experience in information security. And I think if you look at the roles and the HR hiring process, you know, all those job descriptions, they're always looking for that unicorn, right? Someone with 10 years of experience and you know, they want, we want their CISSP and their OSCP and, and you need to have, um, you know, knowledge in SIM and vulnerability management and incident response and all these things. And oh, by the way, it's an information security analyst position. Right? My favorite ever was when we had Tanya Chenka on several months ago now, and she was talking about applying for an application security position. And she's like, you don't understand. I literally wrote the book an application security, <laughs> and I'm not qualified for your posting. So maybe we need to adjust uh, some of those qualifications a little bit. That that one cracked me up. Yeah, I just I just wonder what your thoughts are on 
kind of the gatekeepers in the industry of of thinking that you know we're not going to look internal we're not going to bring somebody up to speed we're just going to try to hire you know this awesome candidate out there but try not to pay them a lot of money and hopefully they work for us right yeah for me i personally like to look internally first you know there's a lot to do to onboard people into organization they have to learn the politics they have to develop the relationships you know that that can take time as well so there's the onboarding ramps a lot higher you know from somebody from the outside so looking internally first there's a lot of benefit there um but if you can't if there's nobody in inside who has interest you know you can ask around um to find out but if there's nobody inside to have interest you have to go outside and then you start having to look at like what these positions have to be and you know, if you're not a large um, organization with a huge security team, um, you got a small team and you need these these folks that have just a breadth of understanding of all different components of security because it's, it's, you know, it's you and one other person or you and two other people or however it goes, right? Um, so that's how I think these job descriptions end up getting written. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, if you, if you qualify for at least, you know, if you've got like, oh, yeah, I can speak to like half these qualifications, you know, write up a letter of interest, send it in, see where it goes. You know, the the labor market right now for InfoSec is um, is uh, is very favorable to the uh, to the per to the candidate. So, you know, send it in, you know, go and talk to the people um, where I'm at right now, like culture is very important. So you have to fit in the culture of the company, the culture of the team. You know, that's how we're really all going to we're going to be able to get together and have a lot of synergy and that sort of thing. Um, so you may not know all these things that you need to know, but maybe, you know, a third, a half, you know, and you can sit down and, you know, talk to us and be, be a, you know, good fit for the team. You know, um, that's, that's where it's at. So that curiosity we talked about is really important. Um, you know, and if you have that curiosity, you nerd out about something. Okay. And bring that the interview with you, you know, nerd out for a little bit. Uh, don't be afraid of that. I mean, don't go overboard, all right? But um, make sure you bring it up. I, you said that you like to look internal first. Now, if I'm an internal employee and I come to you and I say, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in this position, but I may not have certifications. I may not have direct experience where are you going to kind of say, okay, this is a good person. I know his work ethic. I, I've seen him work in the position that he has, but he has no experience in, say, triaging malware or uh, doing some of the information security stuff like vulnerability management and um, putting in different security tools, stuff like that. Where is it kind of the tipping point where you're like, okay, I think I can teach this person everything he needs to know, or maybe he's not at the point where we need to be at. Like, where do you make that determination? Wow. You really, wow. That's okay. Um, <laughs> so work ethic, I think was like the big piece there. Like they have the curiosity, they have the work ethic, you know, we can try and train the other systems. We can send people to train. We can do internal training. That's not an issue. Um, some companies may have issue with it because, you know, training is expensive. You know, if you want to send somebody to a SANS course or something, that it's, it's crazy. Um, certifications are certifications. Um, they are a marker. They get you through the, what was the, the term you used, the, the HR firewall? Was that the <laughs> past episode? Yep. I remember. <laughs> but um, it, that's what it gets you through. Um, but at the end of the day, like, these certs mean a lot of different things. There's certain orgs where you're going to get a cert from them and it's going to mean something more than other ones, but it's not going to be the end all be all. Um, CISSP, for example, you need five years of information security experience just to even, you know, sit the exam and get certified for it. So at that point, um, you probably don't have it. So we're going to have to do that. This is an entry level position, you know, somebody with, you know, one or two years experience at a help desk or doing server administration is somebody that we can train up, right? You've been doing windows admin for two years. Awesome. Let's have a conversation, you know, group policy, AD, these are really important for securing systems. Um, we can talk about port scanning and vulnerability management later. You know, there's tools for that. And the tools today are really good. Um, I'm trying to think of some great examples, but we can talk about those later. Um, but getting people in that have that curiosity, that have that drive, that know your culture, um, you know, that you can give a little training to, I think is really helpful. And um, Andy, you wanted to get into to InfoSec um, where we were at and you know, 
you didn't have vulnerability management experience. You didn't, you know, you weren't breaking apps. You weren't doing reverse engineering. You didn't have certs, you know, but that didn't matter. You know, uh, you had the relationships, you had the work ethic, um, you, you know, performance was really awesome. Like, you know, it was like, okay, this person can do the work. Let's, let's get them a, let's get them a seat in on the team and see what happens. Yeah. I'm really happy that that's the way that you think. And I hope that other people pick up on that because I think it's so important to really look internally because there's so much talent that is already internal. And like you said, that onboarding, that learning of the culture, the learning of the systems, you can sit somebody down, I think, who is internal in front of a new system and they can probably learn that system in a week, but to onboard somebody brand new to a company, it's going to take months to, for them to build those relationships and learn the processes and all of that. So um, I think that uh, I, I'm really happy that, that's, that there are people out there, hiring managers, who have this point of view. And I think what it really comes down to, the question that I, I guess what I really wanted to ask was, where is it that you decided that you can invest in this person like yeah, this person is worth my time to invest in to train up in information security, right? And those are the qualities that we talked about, like being curious and having a good work ethic. Work, work ethic. And I remember when we were working together, one of the things that the CEO actually said was that you're interviewing for your next position every single day. And so it's, when that position becomes open, everyone already knows how you did previously, right? Like you're al you're al always interviewing and you're always being evaluated, even though it may not be a formal process. And if you can demonstrate that quality and that curiosity and the work ethic, then when the position becomes available, people like yourself will decide, hey, this person's worth investing in. I've seen it. I've seen him work. Let's teach him the systems, and I know that they can learn it, right? So when do you think that in the industry, how much experience do you think you need to have before you become a mentor? Because I think as all of us go through this industry, there's imposter syndrome that sets in, right? And how do you decide that you know enough to teach somebody either officially or unofficially about information security? To be honest, I have no idea. Um, you know, a lot of folks, <laughs> myself included, suffer from some degree of personal insecurity, right? Um, you know, side note, like nobody really talks about it, but no one really knows what they're doing. Um, you know, we just... <laughs> I think, you know, having the right people around you and the ability to make quick decisions and then iterate on those, quick, small decisions, iterate on those, that's what leads to a lot, what a, a lot of us would define as success. Um, but anyway, back to the mentoring, you know, to, to be responsible, you should have at least like an intermediate um, level of experience or knowledge in the domain that you're going to be mentoring in, um, just so you can establish yourself as an authority on the subject. Um, I think a lot of people that may be, if you're already asking the question, Am I at a point where I can start mentoring? Yes, yes, you are. I'll make it a quick and easy answer for you. Um, you have experience already. You know, if you've been here for two years um, and you've seen a lot, um, a lot of change in your organization, you've rolled out MFA. You know, you've had a couple of uh, incidents to respond to. Like that's valuable stuff that you can pass on to somebody. Um, so I think as soon as you kind of start to feel like, hey, I have this nice collection of stories that I think others can benefit from, that's the point when when you'd be ready to be a mentor. You know, on that note, that kind of broadens the pool of potential mentors in information security. And a concept that comes up all the time, and even came up on this show tonight, is that the candidate pool is thin. And certainly we need to bring more people into the pool. We need to bring more people into this field. What is almost all of our responsibility to help mentor and bring along 
diverse perspectives in this field? How can we make this a more inclusive field? How can we bring along people who look different than us and more importantly, think differently than us? And what is our responsibility to do that? And that's, that's a tough question, right? If we had the answers, then this field would be more diverse. This field would have um, a, a greater pool of applicants readily available. Nobody's cracked that code, but you know, I'm just kind of throwing this out there as a conversation on the table. Almost everyone has something to give. How can we identify that, that next generation of talent to bring into the mix and get them excited about our business and um, encourage them to step into the roles that we, we really need filled. Almost everyone has um, more information security roles they would love to fill if, they, if there was a abundant pool of talent, right? So I'm just talking out loud and thinking about how, how can we all contribute to, to doing a better job there and giving voices to, to new voices. I mean, it's a really good question, right, Adam? Like, I, <laughs> I think just advertising and making sure that uh, that people know that positions are available, what skills are required, and that not having that gatekeeping mentality, you know, I think that that is puts off a lot of potential candidates right away and just from like information security twitter you know i know that the field is getting more and more diverse but at the same time there's still a lot of negative attitudes towards more diverse candidates out there and so i think for folks who have been in the industry we need to try to speak up about those things for sure and call it out when we see it. Um, I think that that's, that's at least a, a good starting place. Yeah, for sure. And I'm just thinking about like, um, and I, I can't even think of who it was. I'm, I think it was Donna Sarkar, um, who was kind of one of the, the big advocates for power platform at Microsoft. And she talks about like, when you have a platform of some kind, like, I don't know, Andy, this show, we have a platform. Um, how can we use our platform to bring on different perspectives and um, promote those? I, I think that's something like you and I can do, but you don't have to have a podcast to do that. You don't have to have um, a security conference, right? Although those are great options to do it, but um, even on small scale, there's, there's little steps we can take every day, right? And so I think just sometimes repetition helps too. Um, repeating that oftentimes with, with the naysayers, there's the, there's the perception that when we have conversations like this, it's, it's to check a box or it's to appeal to a certain audience. And when we instead reframe the conversation as attackers are diverse, attackers are from all over the world, from all over all different backgrounds and economic backgrounds and, and religious backgrounds and everything else. And if we all look the same and think the same, then we're not going to be able to stay a step ahead of the attackers, right? It's actually a security imperative that we get better at this, or we will, we will lose the war on um, protecting our assets and protecting our companies. And I think when you reframe the discussion that way, maybe that helps kind of challenge some of those, um, negative assumptions about why we're having that conversation. Yeah, it was funny because I was browsing Twitter last night and Matt, you might get a kick out of this, but there was a programmer who did reverse malware engineering and she was a female and she made a comment on how she didn't know how to use Vim and she got attacked by a bunch of people who said, how can you be a person who does reverse malware engineering and all this other stuff if you don't even know how to use Vim? And uh, I just thought, who needs to know how to use Vim? Like, that, that's not even <laughs> important. I use Nano. I don't know about you. <laughs> I don't want to start anything. So. I won't say nothing about the uh, the editor of choice, but yeah. 
<laughs> but no, the, the, so yeah, just like there's not a lot of like inclusion. There's not a lot of like welcoming in in the community as much as, as there probably should be, you know. And um, I've heard that when you have folks who look like you in leadership roles, you have role models to look up to, then you start to consider, oh, this is an option or an opportunity that I can take a look at. You know, we don't have that. You know, we have a um, very um, non-diverse uh, level of leadership across security. Um, you know, it's a conversation we're having, and I really hope it's not something that's going to take a generation to change. I hope it's something we can we can make some progress on now. Because, um, like, to your point, like, this is, it's about, it's about economics of the attackers, okay? And if they're thinking differently, we need to think differently. And if we're not thinking differently, um, we're going to lose. When someone comes to you internally and says, "Hey, Matt, I'm I'm interested in information security. Where do I start? What's that beginning conversation look like? How do you try to foster? You have someone who's curious, okay? Now, how do you try to guide that curiosity, and and where do they start their journey into this great world of information security? Oh man, um, I would say. Let's start with a conversation. What have they heard? What do you know? What do you what do you think about information security? Um, just to kind of gauge on, on on kind of where they're at, figure out where their interests lie, what they like to nerd out on, where their curiosity is at, kind of the position they're at in the company today. Um, you know, are they doing malware cleanup on on Windows machines at at the help desk? Are they doing reimages? You know, or are they uh, configuring Windows servers? And start to use that to kind of link it into security. So now there's this chain that's that's forming. It's like, hey, oh man, I already know a lot about information security. Maybe this is going to be a little bit easier conversation than I thought it was going to be. Okay, cool. So now we've kind of piqued the interest, and then we can start branching out into other areas. But just just seeing what they know, and where they've been, um, you know, and what they're curious about, making sure to answer those questions. So I'm in a mentor Discord and community. And so a lot of people will start their conversations with me. And I've noticed, and I'm curious what your thoughts are on this too, that a lot of people who are getting into information security or thinking about it, who are interested, their first thing is, I want to do pen testing. I want to hack the box. I, I want to you know, find those bug bounties. Um, and, and they may not know, again, these are folks that are new in the industry. They, they don't really have a, a lot of experience and they might even come from the the blue teaming or infrastructure side, help desk side. What are your thoughts on that? Like, if someone came to you and said, "Yeah, that's that's what I've heard. I, I've heard that information security is about pen testing and about hacking into systems, and it's cool and it's sexy." Great. Let's start with that. Um, <laughs> yeah. So with with you know with pen testing, that's great. You can break things. Cool. Um, but what really is going to last is what you can build. You know, as as, as those of us on, on the blue team know, like you're putting up defenses, you're building defenses, you are helping your application and product development teams with their applications. Um, you know, you're trying to build something to generate revenue for the company you're working for. I mean, this is what we're doing at the end of the day, and we want to protect this. We make sure it's resilient. Um, Pen testing is great, and it serves a role in that. It's going to test our defenses, right? So that's one component of what we've got. It's really easy to get going pen testing. All you need is a, you know, some distro you can spin up inside of a VM or from a USB stick, right, or um, a cloud image um, machine, and you're done. You're you're up and going. You can start working on your bug bounties. But if you want to like start dabbling in defense, you know, this is a lot. There's a lot more investment there, and a lot more thought that has to be put into it, and a little bit more guidance. Um, I think that people kind of have to think through. So you come up and say, hey, I really am a big fan of pen testing. This is super cool. I'm like, okay, cool. Let's let's see what that looks like. Let's do a CTF maybe, you know? Um, and then now that you've broken these things, what would you do to prevent somebody from doing what you just did? Yeah, that's a really good answer. You know, Andy, I think of kind of how I fell into information security almost by accident. And the very short version is I became an Office 365 administrator or in the early days of doing it and became a self-taught exchange administrator. And as you have this cloud service, and this is in the old days, you know, 
unless you were doing some sort of like ADFS claim rules or something, if you knocked on the door and you had valid creds, you got in, right? That was early days of the cloud. And as we started to want to secure the cloud more and more, we got into concepts like identity-based security, conditional access, that sort of thing. And as that conversation goes along, it's great. We can layer in more identity controls. We can layer in conditions. We can layer in multi-factor authentication. That's cool. Then that starts to tie into endpoint management. What do we know about the device? Is the device healthy? And it's a totally different side of security than people see of kind of the traditional, uh, more like, you know, red team, blue team, you know, good guys, bad guys, kind of war kind of mentality, because it's not so much like that. It's much more of like building a program, building a set of defenses that are interconnected and tie together and create a chain of trust by looking at different factors. That's security too, right? I mean, identity guy here, of course, I'm going to get excited about that, but there's so many different angles to come into. Of course, pen, text, pen testing is sexy and cool because you've seen the guys in the Hollywood movies banging on their keyboards and, you know, with green text flowing through their screen and it looks awesome. But sometimes securing stuff is still really important and there's different ways to do that. And it's not always about malware and hacking and this and that it's more just identity and device and, and health of the identity, health of the device. And there's different perspectives on, on how to do that. So, so that's how I fell into it was I needed to secure office 365. I started by doing MFA. Then I started adding in device health and looking at all these different factors. And I got to a point when you would have a healthy managed device with a healthy identity to get access to the service. I made it more secure over time. That was interesting. And that's kind of how I fell into it. And so then I started learning a lot more of like the threat protection stuff later. So there's multiple paths too, above and beyond kind of what people see as the, you know, traditional red team, blue team kind of stuff too. To Adam's point as well, a lot of what we do is about like IT operational excellence. We're, we're trying to make the IT systems be more resilient, perform better, mm -hmm. make sure we know who's authenticating, what kind of authorization they have. You want to be able to bring somebody into your organization, you know, send them um, a credential, a device, they can get in, things just work. They have the access they need in SharePoint. They have, you know, every, you know, everything just works, right? And that's that sounds like, oh, cool, yeah, that's an IT thing. Well, uh, yeah, it is, but there's a security component as well, as, as Adam just discussed. You know, I, I used to work for a chief information security officer who said his goal was always to do security in the way a Vegas casino does. Like you're abundantly aware that there is security and that it exists in a Vegas casino, but it's mostly invisible. It's not going to affect your day-to-day -day activity. If you want to go to this table and play some blackjack and you want to go to this table and play roulette, you can do that and, and you're not going to see the controls that are there, but they are. Make no mistake, but you can behave freely and, and it kind of happens behind the scenes. And the important concept to understand there is that simple is harder than complex. Complex is easy. It's easy to have a complex system with complex controls that are all over the place and a mess. Simplicity, invisibility, IT operational excellence, as Matt talks about, that's hard. That's the challenge, right? And that's kind of the cool thing to solve too is how can I do my job while enabling everyone else to do their job too? And that's when I, that might not appeal to everyone, but boy, that appeals to me. I love delivering that great user experience. And I take pride in that. And when the user experience is awesome, everybody benefits. Yeah, when people come to me about talking about pen testing too, I tell them it's not as sexy as you think it is because if you're doing pen testing for a company, you maybe spend 20, 30% of your time, you know, actually finding an exploit and getting in and maybe you get domain admin or something like that. And that's really cool. But then you're going to spend a ton of time writing that report and documenting all the things that you did. And then you have to deliver that report, right? In a presentation to maybe the, the CISO or the director of security or something like that. So it's not all it's cut out to be, in my opinion. It's like not as sexy as everyone think it is. There's a lot of hard work behind the scenes that has to happen. And yeah, even if you're in a company large enough to have your own red team, you know, you might have a little bit more uh, work to do and you might have 
you know, more variability in what you're doing from day to day as far as pen testing goes. But if you're in a smaller company, a smaller security team, you probably don't have a red team. You have somebody who knows red teaming, but you probably hire that out. You know, at what at that point, you know, that, that consultant, they're coming in to do that assessment. They're running with it for the number of weeks that you've contracted with them. They're giving the report and they move on to the next job. And you just, then they repeat, you know, ad nauseum. So like some folks love that. Great. Embrace it. I encourage you to. We need more people to, you know, to come in and try and defeat our defenses. Um, but for other folks, it, it doesn't, it wears on them. And after a time, they're like, okay, well, what else can I do? Hmm. Mm-hmm. And the other thing, too, I tell a lot of people who come to me who are interested in information security, I tell them that every company, you know, I think of it like in medicine, when you think of being a doctor, the doctor that you need the most is that family practitioner, the one that you go to initially, there's always going to be that doctor and there's going to be the majority of them. You're not going to have a surgeon in every single town. You're not going to have a brain surgeon in every single town. You're going to have a family doc. Right. And that's that's the one that you need. Just like at every company, there's that information security analyst, the very first hire. Right. They're going to be building the defenses and every company is going to have one. And if they don't have one, they're probably going to get one at some point. Right. And so that's where the majority of the jobs are, because every company has one. And those generalist skills and um, those positions are going to be the most readily available, in my opinion. Uh if that's what you think too, um, just curious what, what your thoughts on that are. that first stop to to stop and ask that question of, I think the the better off we're all going to be, you know, um, I I don't know if the statistic still holds, but, you know, if you do the top six um, of the um, critical security controls, right, that's 85% of of attack surface reduced. So, you know, you're in a much better ballpark. Um, So just just kind of doing these very broad stroke kind of general things, to borrow your analogy about the family practitioner, it's like, oh, hey, you know, um, um, I have this small problem, you know, maybe I just need to lose a lot of little weight. Okay, well, here we can adjust your diet and we can do this exercise regime and then it's gonna help you, right? Um, the same can be true of the security folks. Oh, hey, you know, we just got fished. Okay, we lost a sum of money, you know, it wasn't very large, we're not worried about it. What we don't wanna do is get fished again, right? So. How do we work on that? And then you say, oh, okay, well, let's take a look at what you have set up, um, you know, for for your email. Let's take a look at what you have set up on your desktops. Um, let's see how people are authenticating the organization. Like, and it's a whole chain of things, right? Um, to start looking at that. I, I like that analogy a lot where you talked about the family practitioner. So final question for you, Matt. If any advice you have for folks who might be listening to the episode and they either want to start mentoring or perhaps I'm a person who's learning about information security and I want to try and find a mentor. Any advice that you might have for those folks? Yeah. If you're looking to move roles, like within your company, look for a mentor there. Um, If you're looking just to kind of develop your, your career graph. Okay. It's a career graph, not path, you know, because who knows where you're going to end up next. Right. Uh, it's a little different data structure, but, you know, look outside the company at that point. Um, if you are, um, you know, looking for, like, to really, um, lost my train of thought. Um, you can also ask your manager, you know, if they know anyone. So what happens sometimes is, like, somebody expresses, hey, you know, I am have an interest in, um, in information security. They say that in their, one of their one-on-one meetings with their manager. Their manager tells their director or may come to me or somebody else and say, hey, this person's got some interest. You, you know, you want to talk to them? Yeah, sure. Why not? I mean, you know, talent is distributed evenly around the world, but access to people is not. So if the opportunity comes up, let's let's talk to some folks. So, um, you know, ask your manager. They might know somebody at the company who can help you out. Uh, find out about and attend local IT events. 
So there are uh, information security events as well. I don't want to, I know this is a security podcast and we're talking about security, but um, as I said earlier, security is IT operational excellence. Um, you can you can learn learn and meet folks there as well. Um, you know, I'm not going to plug any specific orgs, but you can you can Google around. Local universities and colleges typically have things, um, as well as some other nonprofits that, that may be starting up to do more inclusion and diversity in security or in IT. Um, those events are usually open to the public or for non-members to attend, and they're really helpful. Um, you can just uh, meet people there. Um, they, they're social events. Uh, for extroverts, this isn't a problem. I'm more of an introvert. <laughs> So I have to set a goal. I want to talk to two to four people. You know, let's get some business cards and just make a point of it. Okay, um, you gotta get out of your shell for these things. So, you just want to find somebody who's got a lot of experience to share. Absolutely. Well, and and right now, talking about a lot of those like local meetups, local events, many of them are virtual right now. So the bar to entry is even lower. You don't have to go show up at a bar or a place that might be less comfortable to you if you are introverted. Uh, it's just joining another another Teams call or Zoom call or whatever you have. Um, but still, way to meet people locally, see somebody who is presenting locally. And, you know, you can always just hit them up after, especially if, if somebody is willing to present on a subject at like your local InfoSec meetup they're going to be more than willing to be responsive to like LinkedIn messages or, or whatever their preferred methodology is Twitter. Um, and you know, you could bounce some ideas off of them. It might not be a mentorship relationship again, you know, that formal thing, but it's still an opportunity to get pointed in the right direction and, and maybe find that, that next connection that can help you out. But it, it, it sometimes does require us to step a little bit beyond our comfort zone. We do have to make that first step because we don't know what we don't know. Um, most people are very gracious with their time and their attention, but you have to ask first. They don't know that you're interested until you express it. And so that is the one challenge that for people who might be less gregarious, you are going to have to take that first step. And, and that is something that's pretty much not going to change. Right. So. I'll just put a plug real quick for the, Cyber Mentor Dojo, which is the mentorship community that I'm a part of. And it's a fantastic community. There's a lot of great cybersecurity practitioners who are there who have a lot of experience. And I have people who have reached out to me and I've had meetings with them. And so there are other communities out there as well. Um, you can find them on different social media circles, like Matt said, you can look for different organizations and communities on the internet, but reach out to people. Like Adam said, um, a lot of us who've been in the industry, we are happy to give a little bit of our time that we have to bring up the next superstars in the industry. <laughs> right. Well, the other, the other point as well, um, you know, if, you know, if someone like us can't help you, we might know somebody who does like the information security sure. community in your local areas is, is usually people know each other. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Matt, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy day. I know that you are very, very busy. So thank you very much for coming on the show, sharing some of your wisdom. And, you know, I appreciate you for sure for getting me into this industry and uh, I hope you continue to do that work at the company that you're at and you know i'm gonna use your good example to you know bring up the next generation as well so if uh do you have any um contact if there's folks who might want to reach out to you after the show if they have some questions any anything contact you'd like to share that's a great question um we just we'll talk about it after putting the show notes how about that sure no problem Okay, we'll have his contact information in the show notes for you guys. That's our show for this week. Thanks for listening as always. Adam and my contact info will be in the show notes. If you have any questions about the episode or have security topics you want us to chat about in the future, just message us. We'll talk to you guys next week. 
Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.